you are giving your report for your medical code or your medical presentation, there's a specific format that we're going to follow. I will outline this format for you so that there is no confusion. Right? Uh, where, where else uh, this will become important is when you take your national registry exam, there is a skill called out of hospital uh, station that you're going to perform. Right? And in that out of hospital report, uh, uh, sorry, out of hospital station, you're going to give a report when you arrive to the receiving facility. And you're going to give your differential diagnosis, or essentially your field diagnosis, and the treatments rendered, right? And we want to have uh, a format that I will outline that you want to perform. I also want to go through the difference between notification, right, and the report. Uh, if you, any of you guys that work in the 911 system, you understand, right? You're going to give a notification. You call your dispatcher. It's not a full, uh, you know, drawn out uh, thing. You know, some of you guys start. We have a 65 year old male patient. He presents with this condition, he has these allergies, he's taking this medication. That's not the purpose of a notification. The purpose of the notification is to inform the hospital you bring a critical patient, right, so that they get the appropriate resources ready. I'll explain for a different criteria what they are. And then the actual report takes place when you actually arrive at the facility. And I'm not talking about the report you give to the triage nurse where you have a stable patient you're bringing in, right, to get triaged. I'm talking about those unstable patients, those critical patients, who you're bringing to either ED, emergency department recess area, you're bringing them to, let's say, a, a cat lab, right? Or you're bringing them to a thrombectomy center. So your patients are not stable patients. These are unstable patients. And you're usually met by a team or, or perhaps a physician, right? They will ask you for your report. So you want to be concise, right, uh, in terms of your data. And also, right, we want to, I want to, Make sure you clearly understand the distinction between the notification and the report. I know some of you don't work in the 911 system, so I don't want you to be confused. This is based on, uh, it's, it was on the three minutes uh, EM presentation, so emergency medicine. This was designed for, uh, you know, those brand new doctors, the residents who go into the emergency medicine. And usually they graduate medical school and they have not had exposure, right? A lot of them have less exposure than you have, right, as EMTs, because they've been in school setting. So when they start to give the reports, uh, you know, there's a lot of information, so they don't know what to start. So they, they made this for them. I used that study to kind of adjust it so that uh, you can employ it, right? But they have a very good basis. Uh, they employ their faculty and other emergency medicine faculty to, like, give a concise report. So we can employ their strategy. So the, basically the goal uh, that they have is be, to say is the following, right? You want to give under three minutes. So that's, for your case, maybe even shorter time frame. So under three minutes, that's what we're aiming for, right? You want to state the pertinent information. And pertinent sometimes may be confusing. So pertinent is to, pertinent to the chief complaint, right? So the information that you are describing is particular to the chief complaint and nothing uh, outside of it. So for example, if uh, I am complaining of chest pain, you're going to ask me questions regarding the chest pain. You're going to ask me questions. Uh, you're going to do a physical exam focusing on chest pain, right? And you're going to ask my past medical history, which gives me risk factors for chest pain. For example, it could be diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, right? Maybe past MIs or stents, right, that I have. And it's cardiac surgeries. Now, let's say I also had a neoarthroscopy seven years ago, right? And I tell you that, yeah, I, I had this. But for my chief complaint of chest pain, that's not pertinent information. So you, you don't want to include this in your oral presentation in the initial phase. Why? Because that's it's not essential, right? And you're taking away from the, the critical information. And uh, we're going to practice this, that, that it's fluid, right? And that you are giving it, right, in a concise format. We're going to use the, the format in the summary sheet that I gave you. Right? So this is the actual study, right? That was called Three Minute Emergency Medicine uh, Medical Student Presentation. Uh, if you want to read through it, you're more than welcome to do it. If you want to take a picture, this is uh, where you can find it. It's free. You can uh, download it and read it. Uh, it gives you a concise uh, like review. They also have like a, a supplement form with like pictures, and they tell you step by step. But if you want to look through it, it's uh, pretty good. Uh, where where else can you employ it? Actually, if you any of you doing rotations in the emergency room, right? And uh, if you, you know, ask. The residents or the attending can I shadow you? Can I follow you? And you see right when they do their assessments, and then they give the presentation to the attending, or when they do their rounds, right? Everybody knows what rounds are. Yeah. When they walk around to room to room, so they you will see the format that they utilize, so that uh, 
you kind of you know get a, get a grasp of why why they saying it like that, what's the format, what are they talking about, the labs, you know the diagnostics and so forth. So if you want to do a thorough review, you could use that, right? So uh, the whole basis of what they're trying to explain is this, right? In the emergency department, they say basically they want to assume, right, first that the patient has life-threatening or limb-threatening condition. So when you are assessing your patient and they have a complaint, you want to first find those uh, conditions that they potentially be life-threatening. So that's what we want to make sure we check for, right? That's what you're there for as emergency uh, services, right, EMS. So you want to be concise, right, and you want to explain that. So that's the first thing we're looking for. And in the emergency room, right, uh, this is not really applicable to you, but why I bring this up is that uh, you may have one patient, right, that you bring in, but once you bring that patient to the ER, they have a lot of patients, so they have to triage them, right, they have to focus who is, who is first, who is second, who is third, right? If I have, let's say, uh, a minor laceration, and then and you're bringing me a major trauma, right, and I, I don't have unlimited resources, I have to split the resources that the patient who has the major trauma gets, you know, be seen first as opposed to the laceration, right? So this is what they're trying to do. They juggle multiple patients. So that's why the time is of the essence. In terms of uh, priority patients, uh, uh, this is why we're going to give a concise report so they can risk stratify and get appropriate resources, right? And for, for this, is, um, this is basically saying, like, uh, patients tend to hop from hospital to hospital. There's not really, uh, they're not really seen by one provider. They may have multiple providers. It's not really applicable for your cases, but this is... Uh, what they're also trying to see, right? So the the, the overall, right, uh, what's included there, right? So the oral presentations has the following components, right? It has the chief complaint, and the chief complaint is patient's own work. So when you ask them, what is the reason you called the ambulance, or what's going on today, and they'll say, you know, my chest hurts, or I'm having difficulty breathing, right? You, you know how you put it in quotes in your ACR? Patient states chief complaint, right? Make sense? The chief complaint is never a medical <coughs> diagnosis that you made. So, a patient's chief complaint is angina. That's never going to, uh, you know, unless the patient tells you, I have angina, I'm having pain, right? But only then do you put it. But otherwise, a medical diagnosis is not a chief complaint. Or, patient is having a heart attack. That's, that's not a chief complaint, right? That's your field diagnosis. So, whatever they state, that's the chief complaint, right? Then you're going to give the history of presenting color. So that's the pertinent information. So for the chest pain, right, we want to see that that serve diabetes, hypertension, fast stents, right, cabbage, right, things like all that sort. The next thing is medications, and this is not the medications you gave. This is all the medicines the patient is prescribed. So you want to write this down. Any allergies that the patient has, I, more particularly we're looking for allergies to medicines, not foods, right, so uh, ask all the allergies they have. And then we're going to do physical exam, we're going to, Focus on, right, pertinent information again. So I'm not listing pearl, lung sounds clear, right? A lot of you guys tend to write this positive ABCs, negative JVD. We don't need that, right? What we need is positive findings. For example, upon my assessment, patient has crackles in the lungs, or I hear abnormal heart sounds, I hear whooshing, right, sounds. I'm not asking you to become you know, a cardiologist here, but we only know the pertinent, right? Patient has, upon physical exam, we know that patient needs accessory muscles, and he has dyspnea, right? Uh, upon physical exam, we see there's a implantable uh, defibrillator, right, in his chest. Upon physical exam, we see positive fetal edema, right? So only write down pertinent positives. Don't write, like, all the other stuff that you write, right? It's just drawn on report, nobody cares. A pearl, ABCs, LOC, like, I couldn't list off, like, a hundred different. And actually, I know some, uh, you know, partners I work they, once we went to the digital format, like the tablets, they would copy-paste their summary. They just, just changed the age. So everything will be Perl, ABCs, and JVD, and all that nonsense, right? PMS, right? Don't write that. So only only pertinent information. And then uh, this this following is the summary statement and the problem assessment and plan. We, we are not going to have this. So the this is uh, for the residents when they basically provide the like, overall picture of the patient then they're going to say what they think this is and their course of action. So you already, when you bring a patient, you're gonna already render your treatments, right? You're gonna already provide your care. So we are gonna do everything except the summary statement. We're not gonna do the problem assessment and the plan, right? You're gonna be, I'm gonna, I changed it, so what you're gonna state is the treatments you render, right? Uh, so uh, this is gonna be the first uh, step of your patient. So it's basically the one-liner. 
So what's the point of the one liner is you basically want to risk stratify. So stratification is the disease risk factor. What I mean by that? But think of it like this. I say, okay, I'm bringing you a 65 year old male patient, right, who presents with chest pain, or I'm bringing you 65 year old male, male patients with coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, and three stents who's having chest pain. Who, who do you, out of these two presentations, who has a high risk of this being a, like an MI or AC, acute coronary syndrome? The first or the second? The, the second why the second? Who's got information about the history? And, and that information that I got, right, that's the risk stratification. Basically, it's pertinent, right, and it basically becomes high risk. Like 65-year-old male patient with chest pain or 65-year-old male patient with diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, right, uh, plus stents, that's high risk factor. Make sense? Right? So that's why we're going to include, right, some risk, risk stratifying. Uh, and we're always going to include, right, the patient's age, their sex, right, uh, history of pregnancy, chief complaint, right? And so essentially, the, the one-liner, this, this is the front end, the patient is age, years old, the sex, the history, right, so pregnant history, who presents what you're going to say, the chief complaint, patient's own words, right? And approximately how long ago or the duration of the episode, right? So uh, presents with chest pain for one hour. Presents with chest pain, which began, let's say, 8 in the morning and has been there for one hour or 30 minutes or 40 minutes or 24 hours or two days or whatever it may be, right? So you obtain, obtain this, right? The time. Very important to obtain the time. And you record the, this, right? So the... The reason I bring this up, so I added in the slide, so the duration of the chief complaint. So it's very important, right? Uh, because they rank the differential diagnosis based on the chief complaint was on two hours, two days versus, right, two years, which is chronic. And uh, before we go into the OSQ, why do you think it's important to obtain, right, the duration of the chief complaint? You know, how long has it been, how long has this problem has been going on? Why is this important to obtain? For one for your differential diagnosis, why else? Why else do you think? And in the hospital, they'll definitely ask you if you didn't provide that information. They'll either ask you or they'll ask the patient. Treatment is time sensitive. Good. Do, can you give me an example? Uh, like broken. Yeah, excellent, right? Perfect, right? You're, you're exactly right on the point. So let me show you uh, why this is important. So this is this is a little small. I'm going to have a little bigger picture. This is from the AHA guidelines. This is when you bring somebody with a STEMI, right? This is... Um, protocol for ACS to coronary syndromes. I want to focus on this bottom portion, right? I'll basically have a slide that highlights this, right? And you notice, right, if you bring a patient who's having chest pain, right, and their duration is how long has this chest pain, pain been going on? They say, okay, six hours, right? Let's just say, or three hours, or any time frame that's less than 12 hours, right, less than 12 hours, or equal to, they're gonna be uh, down the reperfusion goal. So what are reperfusion goals? They're either going to get a uh, balloon to inflation, so they're going to go to the cath lab and they're going to get a balloon or a stent placed, or they're going to give them lytics, thrombolytics, right? So less than or equal to 12 hours, right? Uh, first medical contact, which is you guys, right? EMS, right? So they got 90 minutes to either take them to the uh, PCI, right? For the coronary intervention, that's the cath lab, or they're going to give them lytics. Now, what if they exceed 12 hours? The guy said, okay, I started having chest pain, began yesterday, and it's been 24 hours at this point. So you record it, right? But greater than 12 hours. So if you see how they may not perhaps go to the reperfusion route, they may be admitted, they're going to lose serial troponins, may be admitted to the CCU, right? And medically treat them. It depends on the doctors there, the cardiologist, right? And the attendings. So they may, uh, the course of care may alter based on the duration of the episode. Make sense? So everything is usually time sensitive because they're thinking, right? Let's say you bring a patient who you did not do a 12 leap, was complaining, let's say, of epigastric pain and they have history of diabetes. <coughs> you bring them to the hospital, they do a 12 leap and they have a STEMI, right? And this place doesn't have a cath lab capable facility. So the doctor is thinking, right, if I don't transfer him to the, to the cath lab, I gotta give him thrombolytics. If he doesn't do that, they may be liable, they may get sued for not providing right standard of care. So they're thinking, right, if I call a private ambulance company, are they gonna come in time or they're gonna come in two hours? Right, so that's the, the thought process they go through, right? That's why they call and ask, you know, how long is the, are you coming? What's the ETA? And so if you, if the doctor knows they cannot, you know, get them to the cath lab, right? Uh, and 
they, some places will go up to two hours for this. Uh, they got to give them uh, thrombolytics, right? So it's a high risk factor here. So that's why we established the duration of the episode of the chief complaint, right? You ask the patient or you ask if someone called for them, you ask, you know, the family members about that. Right. Any questions about this? No? Okay. Right. Uh, so once once you, you get that component, then following that, we want to evaluate the chief complaint fully. Right? And you, again, you're going to look for the pertinent information. So what I mean by that, if the patient has any type of chest pain, I'm giving you an example of chest pain, right? you're going to use the OPQRSTI, right, mnemonic in your, when you're doing your assessment, right? Make sense? Uh, now, if the patient has a different component, say it's altered mental status, obviously your questions are going to change. Make sense? So OPQRSTI is not applicable for every single case. I'm just, because I'm giving you chest pain presentation, I'm using that, so it's kind of easy to understand. But here they say, right, you want to fully evaluate it. So you want, you want to know location, radiation, right, what makes it better or worse, right? So you open your TI questions, include all these pertinents. So here they give you an example, right? So uh, under the first line, you'll say, okay, I have a 65-year-old male patient, past medical history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, right? And stents presents with one hour duration of chest pain, right? Uh, that began until eight in the morning, right? Upon our uh, assessment, right? The chest pain is dull, substernal, with radiation only to the left arm. Chest pain gets worse with ambulation, means you know, if you stand up and start moving, it improves with rest, and some lingual nitroglycerin, right? The pain began this morning, it was 3 out of 10, and now it's 8 out of 10, right? And uh, usually in acute coronary syndromes, right, we, if the pain is not pleuritic, positional, or tended to palpation, it's usually acute coronary syndrome. What I mean by that? If you take a breath in and out, and the uh, pain then increases or decreases, if you change position, the pain increases, decreases. If I touch you, right, the pain increases, and then I remove my hand from there, it decreases. Usually it's probably not a heart attack, right? Uh, so that's why we ask these questions, that's why we assess this. And we definitely want to include this information there, because this helps, again, risk stratify for the physicians there, right? It tells them that you did a complete report, right? So. All, all this, where you get all this, is from your OPQRSTI questions, right, uh, or other clarifying questions. And this goes after you give your duration of the episode, right? Make sense? Don't include anything that's not pertinent in, to this. So if the guy says, you know, he also, besides this, he also has, you know, surgery that's not related to this, and he tells you all that information, don't include it in the here, right? Uh, sometimes the patients may have two complaints, right? Let's say uh, I'm, I'm having, you know, uh, chest pain, right? And I'm also having shortness of breath. So that could be related. So that could be added there, right? Uh, sometimes the other complaint may not be, you know, related to it, right? Let's say he says I have chest pain. And he says, you know, my knee also hurts. So, you know, doing your further assessment, you, real, you realize, you know, here's his knee, right? Uh, you know, down the line, right, when, when he fell and now it's bothering him when you were questioning him. But currently, we have a life-threatening condition of chest pain. So that's the number one problem. That's a life threat that we want to address, right? So the, the knee pain, I'm perhaps not included in this presentation. Right? Uh, here they give you some examples, right, where they uh, have the chief complaints. So let's just do the pain since we already have it, right? So they'll say, the patient describes the pain as number, right? So it's nine out of 10, located substernally, right? Uh, this they give an example like hip or uh, big toe, depending on the pain is. Let's say subdural was chest pain. The pain is sharp, dull, or pressure or throbbing. This you don't ask the patient. Sorry, is the pain sharp, dull, or pressure? You just ask. Can you describe the pain for me? Right. And then whatever they say, that's how you're gonna document it, right? Uh, and then it says uh, the nature in which it's exacerbated by right exercise, inspiration, right? That's pleuritic in nature, positional may be alleviated by exercise, rest, medications, nitri nitrates, nitroglycerin. So you want to report all this, right? Uh, and they give you some other example for diarrhea, right, for headaches. Right now, uh, so the reason why I have this here, obviously if someone's having diarrhea, right, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be asking, right, what's the pain on zero to 10, right? Describe the pain for me, is it dull, right? <coughs> Unless they have a dull pain, right, with that. But with, if they're having a lot of diarrhea, you definitely want to know, right? Uh, the color of the stool, right, right, is there blood in it? How many days, right, and so forth. Right. So I'll, after after that, we also want to uh, find out, right, what changed today that they called 911, right? Why did you call? Because uh, like you don't call 911 for no reason. I mean, some people do, but uh, some people do. Okay. But we want to find out. Perhaps this time is not the case. Or another important factor: what if the patient did not call? Someone else called for them. 
And that becomes very important, right, in some cases. Perhaps they don't want to go to the hospital, someone else called for them. So we want to establish who called and why they called. So perhaps, perhaps they'll say, right, they give an example, right? A patient called 911 today because his, he has severe chest pain and it's the, it's the most severe he has ever had, right? And, uh, you know, he couldn't take it anymore. Or a patient called 911 because this is the exact same pain he felt when he had his first heart attack. And it feels exactly the same. So he calls and you know, he feels like he may have, be having another one. Or it's the asthmatic, right, who got intubated that feels exactly the same, how the tight lungs, right, difficulty breathing and all that. And they remember when they had the same feeling, they were taken to the hospital, they got intubated. So yes, why did you call 911? Oh, I'm feeling like I have a tight chest, can't breathe. Last time I felt this way, I got intubated. So they will tell you this information. It's very important. So again, it, t it helps you to so stratify, right? So you're adding that after that, right? So why they called 911? And then the progression of the chief complaint. So you want to ask them, right, uh, if they have treated themselves, if they, if, if they have not, and you want to see, right, uh, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it staying the same? And also, right, when you give your treatments, let's say you gave in, ch in chest pain, you gave aspirin, you gave nitroglycerin, right, you gave maybe oxygen, you ask them, okay, you told me the, the pain was nine on zero to 10. What is it now? And the guy says, you know what? It's not getting better. It's actually much worse. It's much tighter, right? Uh, I feel like, you know, uh, it's like pressure, like an elephant sitting on my chest, right? So the pain is getting worse. So you'll say, right? Uh, since this episode of chief complaint, right? It's getting worse. It's not, it, or it's unchanged. Or perhaps we gave him uh, nitroglycerin and we gave him oxygen and the patient says, oh, his pain has improved after he sat down, right, on our stretcher. And now the pain has subsided on a, from you know zero to ten to five, right? So you want to say that it's improving, and right the reason why, right, it's getting worse or improving. So uh, you will document that. So it's important to know. So this is why we do our reassessment after we provide our treatments, right? Why do we reassess? We not only reassess our vitals and on the physical exam, right? We also reassess the patient how they respond to the treatment. Because let's say I give you I give you treatments and you're not responding. Right, and I ask you, and you say, no, I'm getting worse. Maybe that will change the course of my treatment. Maybe I'll add something else, right, to it. Uh, maybe I'll pull medical control to request additional doses, right? Let's say someone has severe pain, right? Give an example, you, you um, go to a home and an elderly person fell and broke their hip. And you ask for some fentanyl, right? You gave it, you start splinting, and the patient complained of a lot of more pain. You start moving them, they're screaming, right? And you ask, okay, I gave you some pain medicine, right? And I said, you know what, it improved somewhat, but now it's unbearable, I can't, you know, I can't take it. So maybe you call again, ask for additional dose, right? So you reassess the system, right? Especially when you start taking them on the ambulance with the bumpy road, right? You want to be sure they're comfortable. So we assess that, right? And then after all this, right, that's when you basically uh, follow this up, right? With patient's allergies, the medications they're on, your physical exam findings, right, I told you about, right, for chest pain, maybe positive JVD, positive fetal edema, abnormal heart sounds, right, abnormal lung sounds. I'll give you an example for the next slide. We we'll do our vitals, and then your treatments. So notice, right, this stuff and this stuff is all the way towards the end, right? But when you guys give your reports, what is the first thing you start to give me? Right? So you're like, I got a 65-year-old male patient, blood pressure is 90 over 60. We shot them five times, <laughs> gave five epis, and then, um, you know, we gave some amiodarone, right? Uh, vitals didn't change, right? So this stuff here, I'm not saying it's not important. What I'm saying is you, you don't want to move this all the way to the front. Because then, the, like, it's like the equivalence I can give you is this. You go to the pizza store, right? And the guy at the counter is asking for your order. He wants to know what you want. You want a you know, pepperoni slice, you want a whole pie, right? So he's waiting for you to tell him the order so he could initiate the next action. Make sense? Start making the pizza or put the, the slice in the oven, right? And what you do instead of telling him your order, you come in like, you know what? I walked, I took that ninth street and then I crossed over the bridge and then I made a left turn, right? And then I thought if I was hungry or not, then I decided to walk in. And the guy's still waiting for you to provide the order because he doesn't know what to do next. Right, he's waiting for you to tell. It's exactly the same, the same thing. You come into the to the ER, you come into the cath lab, you come in, they're waiting what to do next. And they're waiting based on your report. Do they need to take the patient to the CT scan? Do they need to call a trauma team? 
Do they need to start, you know, uh, draw uh, blood work for troponin? Do they need to draw blood work to do a cross match for blood? What What is it that they need to do? And they're waiting for your report. Make sense? Right. So examples of your physical exam that are pertinent. So here they uh, give you, let's say, you know, uh, abdominal pain, right? For example, so it's pain, right? So they give you the vitals, which you state. Don't, don't say vitals are stable. Actually list them out, right? And then they'll say, right, upon their assessment, right, they find abdominal exam, which reveal distended abdomen, hyperactive bowel sounds, diffuse tenderness, palpation, but no guarding, right, and no rebound tenderness, right? So they do that, right? Uh, and you could do that, right, with your physical exam, right? Same thing, chest pain, abdominal pain, right, any type of respiratory condition. So that's how you're going to write it down. Only note the pertinent information. Right. So this is the summary page, all of you have the handout, right? I basically, what I did was I copy pasted all the, those pertinent things, right? When you're going to be doing your assessments, like mega codes or physical uh, cardiac exams and so forth, after you, you, you are doing your exam, you want to have a little piece of paper, right, that you're recording it. So when you're doing your exam, you're writing these, these down, right? Once you write them down, right, look at your summary page and try to put it in the format, right? So the format... Uh, is like this and flows. It's going to be a little challenging initially, but once you get it down, right, once you start practicing, you do a few cases, it's going to be a, a, a lot more smoother, right? Uh, so this is the stuff you got. So, all right, make sure you take a look at it. The next thing we're going to talk, uh, so here they give you some examples where, where the students, right, the medical students were making mistakes, right? So just to go to some of them. So here they, they give you, right, failure to include uh, relevant past medical history. So they say, uh, an elderly patient has an acute episode of chest pain, but the student does not mention the patient had a coronary artery bypass graft two years ago. Right, so they did not include the pertinent history. Here they, they included non-relevant review of systems in the history of present illness. So they say a uh, patient has chest pain, but the student also mentions in history of present illness the patient has also had knee replacement uh, in the distant past. Right, so knee replacement is not really pertinent, right, uh, to this condition. Make sense? Right, uh, and right. Uh, here they include some other findings. Here they say poor body language, so the student has distracting gestures. Right? I'm not really worried about that. Uh, in your case, we're going to practice. We're going to make sure you guys are, you know, following this outline that I gave you. Right? Uh, uh, and uh, like I said, the summary statement we're not going to provide. We're going to just state the treatments we rendered. Right? Whatever the care you gave, ALS, BLS. Right? So we're not going to be doing that. Uh, and now we're going to get to this right EMS notification versus PD presentation. So what I explained to you now is this portion. <coughs> right? This, and this is the summary page you got. Is this. And now, who can tell me what's this? You're bringing in a critical patient. You, you pull, it, pull this back, right? So this is way more shorter, more concise. And what's the goal of this? To so have the team ready for get, you at that. Right? Get the team ready. Get the hospital team ready. So when you arrive there, we're waiting and uh, there to accept your patient. But well, my, my advice to you guys is uh, so we're clear uh, and employed. You come in, the patient's on your stretcher, right? And now that you're going to do medics, right, you're probably going to have your monitor, right? Maybe you'll have like IV uh, drip going, right? So there's more things connected to the patient. Do not start giving your report as you're trying to maneuver the patient from your stretcher to their bed. Do the following. Say, guys, give me one second. Let's all transfer him together. Once the patient is on your bed, I'm going to give you a concise report. Right? Why is this important? It's because when, you, when you're doing two things, like you're multitasking, you're not really doing anything uh, correctly. If your wires get caught up, your drips get caught up, you're giving a poor report, your format is not flowing, right? So have this written down on your paper, right, this format. You bring the patient on your stretcher, you say, guys, let's transfer them together. Once the patient's on your bed, I'm going to give you a concise report. And usually when this happens, everybody says, please be quiet, and so you could give it. So transfer the patients first, right, transfer them to their bed, down on your stretcher, and then give you a report. Right, so this, uh, so you guys don't think I'm making this up. This was on one of the CMEs. This was actually a fire department medical director who came in. He uh, was giving a report for EMTs and paramedics how to give proper field uh, notifications because they encountered, you know, uh, notifications that were poor or not done at all or were missing a lot of things that the dispatcher had to queue up and ask you for uh, further things. So this was taken, I, I have the slides here, right, but I have it uh, all clear cut so you guys can see it. All right, so first of all, we're going to go critical medical notification. 
right? Uh, this was from that slide, but this is the components, right? So you're gonna call up, you're gonna say your unit number, let's just say, you know, 41 x ray, doesn't matter, bro. it'll say call and call and no. Uh, the dispatcher will acknowledge, all right, go ahead, x ray with a no. And you're going to state, right, I have a critical medical notification, age, gender of patient, so I got a 65 year old male, right, you're gonna state the chief complaint, chest pain, patient is, right, st status. Alert, verbal, pain, unresponsive. Patient is responding to verbal stimuli. Vital signs, my blood pressure is this, pulse rate is this, respiratory rate is this, O2 saturation is this. Usually I give it, if they're on a uh, um, room air or oxygen, so I'll say, uh, set is 95% with 9 liters, 15 liters. Uh, patient is intubated, the patient is not intubated. Sometimes I'll say ALS established, I'll just say intubation status, and then UTA, UTA is still 10 minutes. Right, you see how concise this is, right? So this is your medical notification. Right. Uh, any questions about this? Clear? All right. The next one we're going to do is this is your trauma, right? For your plantation, right? Like this one's above you. And I want to explain some of the things here. So trauma, what changes, right? So still age, gender of the patient, but now you have mechanism of injury, right? So you'll say uh, pedestrian shock, right? Uh, uh, motor vehicle collision, whatever, whatever the case was, right? Uh, body parts involved, so head, neck, abdomen, uh, whatever it may be, right? Uh, or, you know, you could, you could be uh, somewhat struck, you know, by the train. We have a lot of those now. And then you have GCS, glass cup on scale. Why is this important? And if you don't give it, they'll key you up and ask for this. Because they need to know exactly if there's any brain damage that they need to be worried about. Oh, well, not, to be honest with you, not for that. Below a certain number, you're going to have to perform certain interventions, like... Uh, less than eight does the dispatcher care what interventions you're going to perform? It's who to, it's who to alert in the ER. Okay, you're on the right track. Like so, get the right team ready. it's kind of like a universal, like, um, it tells them exactly what their level of consciousness is, so it speaks to how critical they are. <coughs> so, if you see as a four, you know, like, you know, they're messed up. <laughs> well, she was more close to the, like, in terms of the team, so it has nothing to do with, with the level of. Like, get the anesthesiologist. Yeah, okay. So they, they need to know if they need to have so, the CAT so, scan cleared for this patient. So I will tell you, so the reason this is here is that every hospital, every trauma center, right? You know how you have designations, level one, level two, right? But then to get that designation, they establish certain metric. They'll say, okay, if you call a notification and you say GCS, let's say for our facility, less than eight, our trauma team has to be there within 15 minutes, the entire trauma team, all of them. Whoever is on the trauma team, the surgeon, right, the nurses, the doctors, whoever, right, anesthesiologists, whoever, right, they designate. They have to be there within a certain time. Let's say the inspector comes in to investigate that level one trauma center. You call a notification, GCS is seven, and the trauma team comes there in 20 minutes, right? They're not meeting their metric, right? So they could take away their designation if they have too many, you know, of those issues. So the number that you provide will specify the time frame. So let's say it's GCS, let's say it's 12 or 13, let's say. They have 20 minutes. If the GCS is, is eight, maybe they have 10 minutes. So they have their own established metrics. What they are, every hospital is different. If you're level one versus level two, right, level three, they have their own numbers. You could ask them when you're there, if you're bringing a trauma, like ask them what's, if we tell you GCS is less than a certain number, what's the, your time frame for your team to be assembled? So they'll tell you that. And if someone is inspecting them, right, from the Department of Health, right, or uh, uh, from other, right, trauma services, they would want to see the time frame is established. Uh, so, GCS is very important. I'll show you, I, I, there was a follow-up uh, CME that I went to. The other doctor, he actually uh, had two of these. He had initial GCS, like the first one, and then the second one. So like the, the first one and the second. So two, two GCS numbers, right? Uh, are you have, do you have to split up? Usually not. They'll ask you for the whole number, like eight, nine, ten, whatever the whole number is, adding them together. But when you provide the report in the facility, you definitely want to break it down into these components, say which one is which, right? So this is what it's there for, vital signs, intubation status, and case. The only dif difference between the other one was mechanism of injury. We had the other one was uh, medical, right? This is trauma. And we had GCS, the other one not. Any questions? No. And then the last one is, this is your uh, CBA. Uh, it, ch it changed, right? This was before your ASLAM score, right? So this was the old one, right? This is, if you guys see this, the Cincinnati hospital scale. This is what we used, used to employ, less, less known wall. So now you guys know, right, instead of Cincinnati, we use the, the ASLAM score, right? If it's 0 to 3, you take it to the primary uh, stroke center, greater than or equal to 4, you're going to be going back to me, right, if it's per medical control, right, you have to call them, you're going to get an authorization to proceed. 
And then number four, it means less known well. When was the last time, right, someone saw them, right, uh, that they were talking, walking, right, having no deficits. Make sense? What's the less known well if they went to bed, to sleep, and they woke up with the patient's group and so forth? Last time, last time they, when, they went to bed. when they went to bed. That's very good. <coughs> Patient status in case of all this the same, right? So the only difference here is that we have the S1 score, we have the last known one. Right? And this was the New York uh, stroke triage protocol, right? The, the S lines, right? So 0 to 3, primary stroke, and greater than 4, we need online medical control and take it to the from back to the center. And then this was from the second CME that I went to, it was also another uh, FDNY physician. So here you see, right, this was also a trauma notification. They has two GCS scores. So make sure if they ask you, they make you up and ask you that. Uh, any of you had recent trauma that you give a note to? You have it? Yeah, did they ask but, for uh, with my medics, though. Did they ask for GCS, if you remember? Uh, yeah. Did, did they ask for one or two? They asked for the first one, and then when we got there, they asked for the second one. All right. All right. So make sure, right, uh, you, you get that down, right? Uh, this, this was, right, just to explain to you, we have, in New York City, we have the code STEMI, right, or STEMI alert. What's the difference? Uh, code STEMI is if you have uh, greater uh, or equal to 2 millimeters elevation, they're going to be straight admit to the cath lab, right, versus if you have only 1 millimeter, that's usually, right, you may not perhaps go directly to the cath lab, but you may bring them to the cath lab capable facility. Why right, I have this here, right, so this doctor was explaining uh, that you must pull online medical control before you transport these patients, right? Uh, and what that means is that if you have positive ST elevation, the, the monitor flags it, right, STEMI. You gotta call and you gotta transmit, you gotta wait, right? And why do you have to do that? Anyone can tell me. Why do you have to wait for the doctors to, you know, give you authorization? Some cath labs uh, don't, aren't 24 seven. Good, right? Yeah. So they gotta call and verify, right? Is, is the doctor, like you may have some places doctors on, on call or the doctor is there Monday through Friday, like nine to five, or maybe there's other cases, right? They're like, not emergency, but they were scheduled and they're going, right, to get the stents. And if you bring someone there, all the tape, all the cap, uh, tables are occupied, right? You're not gonna have room for that patient, but they have to call and they have to verify, right? And uh, they, this doctor, I remember, showed this list, right? This is the, they have the numbers for all the cath labs and they, so they call them up, right, before you guys transfer. They all ask, is the, is the cath lab available? Is the team available, the doctor available? So, and then once they get, yes, you go, right? Uh, uh, the, there was a few medics, not few, there's a lot of medics who got restricted because they were very close by to a hospital that they thought and they knew was cath lab capable. They didn't call because they had a STEMI and uh, they got restricted and he said, right, uh, if you transport to the PCI without a medical control approval, you're going to be screwed, basically you're going to be restricted, right? And that's Sydney doctor telling you this, right? Uh, and why is he telling you this? Because, like I said, he brings someone there, the cath lab is occupied, they don't have any availability or the doctor's not there, the doors are locked, you basically brought a patient to a facility that they cannot get care, right? So make sure you call, right, you transmit, and you don't start moving until you get authorization. Uh, if you're, sometimes the, the machine will flag it as acute STEMI, even though, uh, you know, you may see it's not a STEMI. For the FIDNI policies, right, if you work 911, you still have to transmit uh, that EKG, right? Right. Any questions about? Uh, for the last one, it says uh, left bundle branch blocky and then flag zero have to uh, try to so, about this one? Yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, so usually left bundle branch block uh, yeah, is, is usually, right, it was one of the mimics of the right. STEMI. So if you have a left bundle, it's not usually a STEMI yeah, unless. Uh, right bundle. Right bundle, right bundle you can interpret. It will actually look exactly like a, you know, ST elevation, like a normal. Uh -huh. Like on the right bundle, you may have. We still have this. Okay. Up short. But on the left on the left bundle branch block, the problem is is this is the right yeah. all of the morphology like this. So you may not see there is something called scrobosa criteria, yeah. right, that they tell you uh, that you could employ. Some some doctors will not know about this, right? And uh, you may try pulling medical control and explaining that to them, uh, and explaining that to the facility, you can try it with scrobosa criteria. But either left bundle branch because of this morphology is uh, one of the. So for right bundle, uh, if it flags, yeah, I have to call. Yeah. Okay. Any EKG that flags does a huge semi, you have to call. Okay. If you're working in the 911 system. So this is okay. This is yeah. All right. Um, <coughs> so 
this is stop. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? Everything's clear? Yeah.